this. I'm not doing your hand thing. Do it. <laughs> not doing it. Do it. You want to see your silly hand thing, you can come do your silly do hand it. thing. Do it. Do it. There you guys are. You look great. I don't see us yet. I see you guys. Jerry Neathman is live. Talk about it Tuesday, the mortgage process step by step. All right. So I don't know. I'm going back to Zoom. What's up, everybody? Jerry Neesman of the Neesman team with Keller Williams Realty. And we have our special guest here today, uh, Debbie Griffin from Florida Advantage Mortgage. And we will uh, introduce her in just a couple of minutes further. But uh, real quick, as we let everybody jump on here. Um, How's everybody doing? <laughs> how is everybody? How's everybody doing with this? Like, what are we on? Week 20 now of this? I don't know. Garbage. Um, I feel like my mood is fever dream. <laughs> We're in a fever dream of, of stuff. We're on quarantine. What did you do? Quarantine two words? 54, 55, 56. 56. I mean, really, it was only 54, but I did three houses in one yesterday. So you have been six homes. It's starting to turn it. Did you see there's a tropical storm coming? Yeah, I saw. Debbie, it's, are you ready for a tropical storm? It's all because. Uh, ready or not, here it comes. <laughs> I, it, it's all because I was talking to an insurance guy yesterday at baseball practice. And, Did you see that? And I said, yeah, there hasn't been any, uh, hasn't been any issues. And sure enough. I yep. Like you jinxed us, Jerry. By saying measements aren't traveling in 2020. <laughs> so I guess nobody is traveling in 2020. Jerry, tell me about yourself and your team. All right, so uh, for anybody that doesn't know me, I'm the team leader of the Neesman team at Keller Williams Realty. Uh, one of the top agents in our office, 10 years in real estate, over 500 families helped buying and selling real estate here in Southwest Florida. Um, and the, the magical voice in the background is uh, my lovely wife, Rachel. So she is here, although she's sitting across from me. Um, she is going to interject any questions that anybody has while we're doing this, uh, this video here. Um, so if you've got questions, type them in the, the chat box and then Rachel will interject and ask them as we go. Um, so this is an interactive process. Anybody that's watching is welcome to ask questions. Uh, and if you weren't able to catch it live, uh, you can always ask questions later on and then we will respond to those as they pop up as well. Um, so today is, uh, I guess, episode number one of what we're going to do a multi-part uh, series talking more in depth about the money when it comes to buying and selling real estate here in Southwest Florida. I feel like that's a loaded question, right? Yeah, the, ma the majority of the questions people ask is about the money. We don't get a <laughs> yeah, it doesn't come up a whole lot. Um, so it's all about the money typically is what everybody asks. So we figured we'd dive a little deeper into that. Um, for anybody that hasn't seen our previous videos, talk about it Tuesday. We do basically every Tuesday at four o'clock uh, talking about something to do with real estate. We did uh, last month, we did multi-part uh, I think it even ran into the early this month, um, but multi-part series on investing in real, uh, real estate investing. And uh, so now we're going to dive more into the money. So um, yeah, so make sure if you got questions along the way, if you have any that come up or if you've got some already, feel free to throw them in there and we'll answer them as we go. Um, but we've got some things to talk about already. So um, I will introduce Debbie here. She is... Uh, one of our preferred lenders, and we've been working with her for a while now. She, uh, yeah, she's part of our team here in our office, our Keller Williams office. So she has space in our office there. Um, so she is a local lender, and um, she's been. <laughs> Rachel says one of the nicest people she knows, um, <laughs> and she's been doing this for 25 years now. So she's got a ton of experience. Um, she's worked both as a direct lender and mortgage broker, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the differences between the two, 
I was, was going to say because I don't know. Yeah, and uh, she she currently functions as a loan officer for a broker. Um, so I'm going to let her uh, jump in and kind of take over and tell us a little more about herself. So thank you, Jerry and Rachel. Um, I've been in the business, as you said, for 25 years. I love what I do, as crazy as that is. Um, always in Southwest Florida. I was born and raised here. No sense in leaving paradise. Right. Um, <laughs> the difference between a prequal and a pre-approval. The prequal is a you have filled out an application for um, your preferred lender and they have pulled credit. And based on the information on the application, such as income, assets, job longevity, et cetera, they write a letter so that you may get your offer in. A pre-approval, um, which is what I prefer, is when I ask you for income documents, asset documents, documents to back up your prequal actually, and just verifying the assets, the income, everything. It's just a stronger position um, when you go to make an offer. Yeah, so, um... So what Debbie's talking about when you when you go to apply with a mortgage company, there's a number of different uh, types of documents that you can get from a lender. And basically, you know, when you go and look at houses, especially in today's world, uh, where in most places, especially, I mean, for sure here locally, and from what I've been hearing from the uh, the other people that I network with all across the country, the other realtors. Um, most areas right now are in a pretty significant buyers uh, or sellers market, uh, meaning there are way more buyers than there are sellers and homes available. And so you're typically competing with other buyers. Um, and so you want to be in the strongest position possible when you make the offer to get that buyer to pick yours over the other offers that you might be competing against. So before we go look at any houses at this point, and most sellers at this point won't even let you go see their house if you don't have if you have not been pre-qualified at least. So if you don't have some sort of documentation, the seller won't even let you in the door because they want to know that you're at least serious enough to have talked to a lender first. So when you go talk to a lender, mm -hmm. typically they ask for the bare minimum. They have you do an application online, they look at your credit, they ask you what you made last year. Um, or what you make an hour or a month or however they want to break it down. Um, and then they give you a letter based on that information. So yes, if everything you put on the application is accurate, here's your pre-qualification letter. And that says you can go out and look at houses. It doesn't mean you can actually buy one. It doesn't mean you're qualified for one. Um, so then what Debbie's talking about, the, the next kind of step in the qualification process would be an actual pre-approval letter where they have actually verified, they've seen your pay stubs, they've seen your bank statements, they've, um, they've verified all that information to make sure that it's accurate, um, they've verified your debt to income ratio, and now they really know that as long as, you know, of course they still got to do their, their underwriting process and everything, which we'll get to later on. Um, but they've done a lot more verification and it's a much more solid document. So a pre-approval letter is really, that's what Debbie typically does for all of our clients when it comes to going in and looking at houses and being able to make an offer. And it's, it's more comparable um, or more, you know, it's, it's better than, than just having a basic pre-qualification letter when you're trying to compete against potential cash buyers and things like that. It just, it makes it you know, makes people feel a little bit more comfortable that you're a little further along in the process. Um, so, Debbie, are there any cons to getting a pre-approval, like taking that extra step and doing a pre-approval? Um, not really. I always prefer it. So at 
though I am not an underwriter, I'm at least evaluating the income and making sure that we fit in the guidelines of the kind of program we're going to be asking for. So I feel like it's a real advantage to have a pre-approval and to have gone that extra step. And when we do that, that means I already have the documents needed to go into underwriting. So that's a big plus. The second, Jerry, that you give me a contract, I can put the loan in underwriting and really get a jump start on that ticking clock of closing day. Yeah, so really the only, if you want to call it a con, the only potential con is that it takes a little bit of extra time up front. Yeah. So, but, you know, we can't, yeah. we can't get a pre-approval letter in an hour like we can a pre-qualification letter. Exactly. That but is, yes. the benefit is that you've got a lot more information. You've done that work up front. So now you don't have to do it on the back end. Yeah. And, um, and you've got a, a lot more value in your offer when it's presented versus just going in with a pre-qualification letter that says, yep, I filled out an application. They looked at my credit. My score is okay. Right, right. Um, so, all right, cool. Um, so Debbie, real quick, uh, go back one minute and tell us the difference. So you are working with a mortgage broker now. Um, you've worked as a direct lender before. Can you tell us the differences between the two? Because most people yes. don't know. Yeah. Yes. The difference is um, when you work for a direct lender, you're working for that one institution. That means you have that one chance to get rates and get the loan done. Um, the broker side of things gives me an advantage, whereas I can shop rates among, amongst big lenders, many different lenders, and I can also know what lender fits the client's situation the best. I know what lender to put them in to give us the best chance of getting approved. So as you said, I've worked for both. I love both. Um, but right now where the market is, I feel the best place to sit as, is as a broker. So basically the, the benefits there's of course pros and cons to both sides. Yes. Um, but with being with a direct lender, typically they have their own in-house underwriters. Um, but you're limited to the programs that that particular lender offers. Correct. So that would be kind of yeah. like going to, um, you know, either going direct to your bank, like let's say you bank with Bank of America or Wells Fargo or whatever. You go to them and ask them for a loan for a mortgage that's a direct lender or um, like rocket mortgage or Quicken loans. Like that's a direct lender as well. Um, right. Correct. Correct. Versus you but being as, a broker, you have all these different banks, which all have a little bit different programs, different guidelines. Even, even every bank's FHA program is not the same. Right. And you will find that mostly in direct lenders. Every lender has their overlays, what is what we call it in the business, where they have added to the federal rules, which is dictated by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Well, if you go to Bank A, they may have overlays that Bank B does not have, meaning extra rules to give you the money. Mm -hmm. Whereas being a broker, I'm largely using big, big lenders, wholesale lenders that tend to underwrite more directly to the guidelines, not adding as many overlays, as many extra rules. Right. So they they stick more to the basic federal program right 
which guidelines. a lot of times will allow you a little more flexibility. So just because exactly. Bank of America said, hey, sorry, you can't get this mortgage. It doesn't really mean you can't get that mortgage. It just means you can't get it through them. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> well put. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So let's see here. What? Where are we at next? So we got um, the prequel and now we're going shopping. So yeah, so now you've, let's, let's say, so step one is basically the application. And now, depending on who you've applied with, you've either got your pre-qualification letter, uh, which we call pre-qual, or you've got your pre-approval letter. Um, and now we're out looking for houses. So that's step two, is we go and look for houses. Obviously, we're trying to keep it within the guidelines. Um, and one of the things that, uh, that a lot of lenders don't do, um, but that Debbie typically does, one of the reasons we like working with her is she will actually sit down and explain to you, it's not just, you know, oh, you're approved for $300,000. She'll tell you what that payment will look like ish. It's not going to be exact because we don't know exactly what price. We don't have a locked in interest rate yet. We don't know taxes. We don't know HOA fees and that sort of thing. But she can give you a good idea of what that payment looks like so that you know if you're comfortable paying the payment at 300000 Because a lot of people get approved for $300,000, but they're not comfortable with that mortgage payment. Maybe they want a $1,400 a month mortgage payment. Well, $1,400 a month does not equal $300,000 house. So we have that conversation, which... Um, you know, which Debbie does a lot where I get people that come to me that have pre-qualification letters from other lenders and they're like, oh yeah, so I'm approved for $300,000 and I want my mortgage payment to be $1,200 a month because when I went and looked on Zillow, it said my mortgage payment would be $1,200 a month, but Zillow didn't tell me that I have to pay property taxes and homeowners insurance and HOA fees on top of that $1,200 a month. And I want all that stuff right. included in $1,200 a month. Exactly. So, um, so Debbie will go over all that with you. And then I have a calculator that I can help with as well when it comes to, you know, once we're looking at specific houses and we know taxes and insurance, and we can always call her and get a better act, a more accurate number than what I can give on my, uh, my calculator as well. Um, so then we're going and looking at houses. Um, of course, that's my part, and we try to make that as easy as possible for you. Um, so we go through, help walk you through that process, finding the right house that fits all your needs and wants. And then, um, so step three, once we found the house that you like, when we put the offer in, we come to an agreement on price and terms, then it goes back to Debbie. So we've got the contract now. And we provide her with the contract. And then she said earlier, we go, the next step is going into underwriting. Right, right. And the good news is I already have all the documentation. So I can immediately put you into underwriting. And what the underwriter does, an underwriter is the risk manager for loans. They determine if we meet the guidelines and that we can qualify for the house we want. So that's a very important step. We put it into underwriting. Now, while that's an underwriting, we also put out disclosures. Um, by law, we must disclose closing costs, estimates, and many other things, the rules and all the mortgage requirements. So you'll also, while the underwriter is underwriting, get disclosures to sign. And then Jerry usually recommends um, you get a home inspection. Yep. And Jerry, what are the types of things that the inspector will be looking for? This is not something required by the lender, though I wholeheartedly recommend it as well. Yes. Yeah, so home inspections typically, um, they don't, 
the lenders don't require a home inspection per se, but sometimes they do require like a termite inspection. Uh, depending on the loan program, they might require a septic inspection or a water quality test. Um, so those are some of the inspections. If you know if the home's on well and septic, some of those may be required depending on the loan program. Um, but yes, yeah, so your home inspections are paid up front, um, out of pocket, in addition to whatever closing costs and down payment you have. Um, and they typically range between 350 and maybe a thousand dollars, depending on what, it, like a basic home inspection is typically between 350 and 500. Um, but depending on the other inspections that you may need or want to do, you can get up to, you know, somewhere in the thousand dollar range. Um, and basically the, the home inspector is gonna go through and look at the home and make sure that there are no obvious defects that, or not so obvious defects even, that the seller may not be aware of or did not disclose. Um, so they're checking to make sure that the plumbing all seems to be working right, that the electrical all seems to be working right, that the roof looks to be in good shape, um, that the air conditioner seems to be functioning properly. Um, so we do all of that typically within the first 10 days to 10 to 15 days is, is a typical inspection period. Um, what is the mortgage doing? So going through the underwriting, yeah, it's going through the underwriting process. The underwriters are verifying all the documentation and, um, you know, and then potentially asking for additional documents depending on uh, what they need. So, right. um, so basically that's the inspection part. We'll handle yeah. that. And then, and then um, once the inspection is, um good and everyone's happy with it i ordered the appraisal and the appraisal will is designed to tell us what the value of the home is because we the lender obviously aren't going to loan on a home if the value isn't there or we may have to renegotiate so once the inspection is done i order the appraisal and the um, appraisal, they can be anywhere from usually 450 to 575 ish. Um, and it will cover exactly like it'll, he will take pictures of your home and it, he has a whole bucket list of how he comes up with value. But the number one way is he will rec he will um, bring in comps. So um, the comparable homes that have sold in the area, immediate area, is largely how they come to the value of the house. And yep. you, the borrower, obviously get a copy of that. Yep, so the appraisal would be another cost that you would have um, outside of your closing costs that typically has to be paid up front. Um, so you would have to pay for the appraisal when they order it. And then the appraiser will come out, they'll look at the property, they'll do their valuation determination, do all the research on the, the recent sales in the area um, you know, that are similar and come up with the number. And ideally, the home appraises for at least what we're under contract for yes, or more. Ideally, knock on um, usually does. <laughs> yep. So most of the time, we come up with a number similar to what the appraiser comes up with or better than what the appraiser comes up with in terms of yeah. the value yeah. may, you know, they may say the, that it's valued a little bit higher than actually what we're under contract with. So those are the two good ones. If it comes back below, then we go back and renegotiate to uh, try and figure out, you know, try and get the, the seller to come down to the appraised value um, so that you don't have to come out of pocket with extra money to be able to get the home that you want. Yeah, yeah. And while all this is happening, the underwriter usually has provided a conditional approval. 
And that means the underwriter has said, yes, I will give you a loan, but I also want a letter explaining this or um, an extra pay stub or we need verification of the job. There's all kinds of things they will ask for, but because I've collected most of the documents up top, initially, I get very few conditions and that's ideal. Um, so we'll, we then ask you for whatever it is the underwriter wants. While you're working on that, we've also ordered title and title is a very important part of closing. Um, it, we, the lender, want to make sure, as you do, that the title is free and clear, and they give a policy to that effect. So that's a, a very important step. They also order the survey, which is an outline of your property lines and exactly where your home sits within those property lines. Yep. Um, so... Um, so real quick, if anybody's curious who the underwriter is, they're the Wizard of Oz, basically. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not Debbie. Debbie. It, so, and also, so you'll talk to Debbie. You'll also <laughs> typically talk to a processor yes. uh, from the lender along the way, and they're helping collect documents and, and get everything through, uh, you know, through underwriting, but you will never talk to an underwriter. When I say an underwriter is like the Wizard no, of no. Oz, you don't get to go behind the curtain. There's, uh, I have one time in over 500 deals, one time I have spoken directly to an underwriter. And I thought, like, I think underwriters are more difficult to talk to than the president. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> well, Jerry, you know, if you or the borrower is talking to the underwriter, it usually is not good. So. Right. No, it, it's not. <laughs> um, so we did. We did. And that, that was the whole reason I had to talk to the underwriter because they needed somebody that could actually convince somebody to do something we wanted them to do. To talk to the underwriter <laughs> but we did get the deal done um good good so um so yeah that was like i said and and i never thought that would happen i mean i asked and begged and i said listen i swear i'll be nice i won't yell at them i know that's their job <laughs> is to you know is to make sure that deals are done properly and i begged and pleaded and luckily the underwriter said okay yes but don't give them my direct number. You, I call, <laughs> I had to talk to the loan officer who called the process, uh, called the rep for the mortgage company who then called the underwriter. <laughs> um, but yes, um, we got it done. So that doesn't happen very often, but they, you know, their job is to basically they're like a detective. They're supposed to go through all the paperwork yeah. and find yeah. anything that could be questionable and then make sure that it's not, you know, that it that it's verified and accurate. Sorry, I got kids screaming in the background. That's what happens when we work from home. Yeah. Um, yeah. The underwriter but, uh, is the risk manager. It's their job yes. to make sure that the loan is a safe bet doesn't get the borrower in trouble or the lender in trouble in the long run. Right. So yes, they like to stay undercover. <laughs> yes. Um, and then what was the other thing? I, so, oh, and when you mentioned title being ordered, what she's referring to is a title search where the title company will go and search the historic, like they go back through the entire history of that property and yeah. the title changing hands and make sure that there's no outstanding liens, um, that ownership has been transferred properly. And then when she said they issue a policy, she's talking a, an insurance policy. So this is a title insurance policy that says, uh, that ensures both you and the lender that 
if there is anything that comes up later on, um, you know, the farmer who originally owned the 8,000 acres that was subdivided and then subdivided and subdivided, uh, his great great grandson comes back and says, No, I still own this property somewhere down the line. There's an insurance policy that will protect and, and pay out if that is deemed to be uh, an accurate situation. So title insurance, believe it or not, uh, a lot of people think it's a wasted expense, but it's actually a good thing. I've actually seen it come into play a few times. Um, it doesn't happen often, but when it does, you are very glad you have it. Yep, yep, it's very important. Well, at this point, we've gone through underwriting, we've given the underwriter anything else that is needed, and we've got title work, appraisals, and it's usually time for the initial CD, closing disclosure. And this is a closing disclosure that is more accurate than the very first um, loan estimate you got with the closing, with the initial disclosures. This estimate <clears throat> should be pretty close to what you're going to see on closing day. And the rule is we must have it back. We send it out to the borrower no later than day four prior to closing and get it back by day three. And if for some reason that doesn't happen, closing has to be pushed out some. So we always try to stay on top of that and um, get it out as soon as possible. I like to get it out well before the four days. Um, and once that's signed and the underwriter's happy with everything. We got all our ducks in a row. They issue what's called a clear to close, which is a very good thing. <laughs> um, that means we're done torturing you with paperwork and questions. And um, the, the loan then moves to the closing department. And so Debbie, let me, let me interrupt yes. you real quick. Okay. So on the... On the closing disclosure, which is commonly referred to as the CD, yes, um, that what what does that look like? What like okay? Tell us tell us what it Good looks question. like. Tell us what's on it, so that, you know, so people know what they're what to expect. Yes, what you will see on this is the lender's fee, the underwriting and processing fee, fees for credit everything needed to underwrite the loan. Then you will see the title charges, the title search, title exam, title closing fee, um, recording of the mortgage once it's signed. Um, and you will also see survey charge and the doc stamps on the mortgage and the intangible tax on the mortgage. And those are taxes put on a real estate transaction that are paid to the county and one is paid to the state. It's a way that Florida makes money. We don't have state income tax. So um, we do have the real estate tax when a real estate transaction happens. And that's very quickly in a nutshell, what you'll find on the closing disclosures. So yeah, so basically it's a breakdown of all the expenses, all of the costs, yes. all of your closing costs. And it will show now does it, it also shows and I don't, I'm asking, and I can't remember for sure, because I don't ever see them. Um, uh, because it goes directly from the lender to you as the borrower. Um, but it includes their payment and all that stuff too, right? Interest um, rate it and everything. shows, it'll show, yes. The very first thing it shows is the purchase price up top and then the loan amount, and then it will break down your payment. 
principal and interest, taxes, insurance, flood insurance, if you are in a flood zone, and uh, HOA, if you have that as well. Okay. So basically it breaks, the, the whole point of the closing disclosure is to break down so that you can see exactly what it is that you're paying for everything and how much you're paying for each of the things. Um, and it's, it's basically a duplicate, but more accurate duplicate of the original disclosures that they sent you right when we went into underwriting yeah. um, back in the, the early stages of the process because their federal guidelines require they disclose all of those numbers up front and so a lot of times your, your CD will actually come in with numbers lower than what the original disclosures were because they always try and estimate high um, because the federal government has gotten so involved in this stuff that if their numbers are low, if they estimate low and the numbers come in higher on some of these items, it comes out of the lender's pocket. They have to pay the overage. Yep. So most of the time it will come in the same or lower than what the original disclosures were. Um, and again, it's still an estimate. It could change slightly depending on what, uh, you know, if there's any uh, last minute adjustments that have to be made because they haven't, um, they haven't compared with the title company at this point yet. Um, so they don't know exactly what what this particular title company is going to charge for their their closing fee or their search or you know whatever they all have slightly different fees so um so it could it could vary a little bit because of that but it should be pretty close at this point right um, and like she said it has to be uh acknowledged meaning you as the buyer have to sign it and get it back to them and it's all done electronically but uh you have to sign it at least three days prior to closing. If you don't, it delays your closing guaranteed because yep. again, federal government's involved. This is a federal guideline. This isn't a lender imposed guideline. It's not something we can ask for an exception on. If you wait and don't sign it, <laughs> if you wait and don't sign it, you will not close when you wanna close. Correct, correct. Um, now, when the package goes to the title company, the lender's closer and the title company's closer compare it, get all the numbers just right and perfect, and they go through many checks because they have to check every single thing um, to make sure the numbers are right. Then um, the lender gives the title company the okay, we're okay, this is correct, and they send the title company the lending package for closing, the closing package. And so we get all, all the docs, everything with the title company, and you come in or close by mail, but the important thing is that day that is on the closing package, which comes from the contract, you must sign on that day. And you wire funds. Usually um, the title company will give you the closing statement. I all, I'll also make sure you get the closing statement so you know exactly how much money to wire before you go to closing, at least the night before or the morning of. Yep, and we always try to get the, you know, whatever money is due, we try to get it there early just to make sure that it yep. gets there, you know, that it's there and everybody has it. Because again, it's going to the title company or the attorney, whoever's handling the closing. It's not going to the seller. So it's not like they can take the money and run and not give you the keys to the house. Um, the title company holds all the money until everybody has signed off on everything. And then they release the funds to the seller and you get the keys. Um, and here in Florida, you get keys the day of closing typically. 
Um, so there's no delay. Like some, some states I know you have to wait till the deed is actually recorded with the county. Um, here in Florida, as soon as the deed doesn't, the deed will get recorded in a couple of days, but uh, you, um, once you close, it's yours. So, um, so we've gone closing department. They've sent all the paperwork to the title company. They've verified, made sure that the, um, that all the money matches, that they've accounted for every penny of everything that's going everywhere. And um, then you go in to sign the day of closing or in the case of a mail away um, where you're not here local to sign with the title company. Um, you know, they, that's what we refer to as a mail away closing where we send paperwork to, um, to you as the buyer and borrower. Um, and typically they would have to send, if, if you're financing it, then they'll have to send a notary as well um, because everything has to be notarized. And so even then you would sign on the day of closing and then the notary will scan and email the documents back to the title company so that they have verification. They can make sure everything was done correctly. And once they verified that, yes, everything's, all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and everybody's dated everything properly, then they will uh, overnight the all the original documents, original signed documents back to title for the, uh, the next day. And you are now a happy homeowner. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yep, then it's time for the red carpet. Yep, yep. So um, then we would get you the keys and it is now your house. Yay. Yep. I have a question. What question you got? I think moving in the pandemic, but I know we get a lot of great questions about does it make sense to refinance right now? So talk to us a little bit about it in addition to what's the cheapest way, like I don't wanna pay anything, but I want my rate to go down because I'm a homeowner too and that's exactly what I want. So um, is there any refinancing with no closing costs going on? Um, no, you have closing costs when you refinance. Now, um, some banks will offer to pay those costs for you, so they advertise no closing costs. And um, if you have a VA or an FHA, you can do a streamlined refinance, which the costs are lower because you're already in that type of loan. But um, typically the perfect position is you have enough equity in your home to pay for the closing costs. Now you do get a discount, like if you have your title policy, well, we can do a reissue credit on that and give you, you know, uh, costs that are lower. And if you have a survey, you don't need a new survey. So it can be cheaper than the first time. It's a little bit involved, but um, the perfect reason is to lower your rate and payment. Um, and, or if you wanna take cash out for an improvement, et cetera, it also allows you to do that as far as long as you qualify. So yeah, there's there's always going to be closing costs. Even when they advertise no closing costs, you're paying for it somewhere. Right. It's basically what it's what they're doing is they're typically inflating the interest rate a little bit to cover the cost of the closing costs. So you know instead of let's say, uh, you know, let's say you could refinance today and I don't know what the rates are today, but it, I mean, let's just say it's a 2.75% because rates are crazy low like that right now. Yeah. Um, you could refinance it at 2.75. Well, they might write it at a 2.875 instead and then say no closing costs because that eighth of a percentage 
over 30 years is a couple thousand dollars. And so that couple thousand dollars now, so you refinance it at 2.875 instead of a 2.75. And now they've got enough money to cover some of those closing costs or maybe all of them, depending on what their, you know, what their, their margins are. So you're going to pay for it one way or another. It's just a matter of, do you have to come out of pocket for it? Or do you take a slightly higher interest rate to be able to cover them so that they they pay the closing costs for you based on the money they're making on the rate? Or do you, like Debbie said, uh, have enough equity in your home that you can just roll it in? So let's say you owe two fifty on your house, and your closing costs are you know what five six thousand dollars something like that. So now instead of owing two fifty, you're going to owe two fifty five on on the new loan. And so it's not technically a cash out refi uh, because you're not getting any cash directly handed to you. You're just rolling those closing costs in. Right, right. And now is a big boom in refinance because rates are ridiculously low, as you said. Um, so if you want to do that, now is a good time to look at your options. How do, you, how do people get a hold of Debbie? Drop, can you get us some email, phone number? Yeah, Debbie, go ahead and you can say it on here. How how can everybody get a hold of you if they're interested in talking to you about refinancing or if they've got specific mortgage questions? Um, how can they get a hold of you? And then we'll uh, we'll put it in the comments as well, but just go ahead and tell everybody how they should get a hold of you. Okay. The best way to get me is my cell phone which is 239-980-4209. Um, my email is Debbie, D-E-B-B-I-E, at florida-advantage.com. And I'm going to type it all. Yep. So Rachel will type it all in the comments as well. So you guys okay. have that. Um, and then you can text her at that cell phone number as well. Yep. And so that's, that's all I got. Debbie, you got anything else? I think we covered everything. All right. Rachel, do you have any uh, no, other questions, so comments? Else, just let everybody know how they can find this video afterwards. Give them our contact information. And uh, what are we talking about next week? So yeah, we are, um, of course, to get a hold of me, uh, Jerry Niesman here on Facebook, Jerry Niesman on YouTube. Uh, if you wanna go back and watch this video later, or if you want to check out our channel and see any of our other videos that we've done, um, talk about it Tuesday and home tour videos. Like we said at the beginning, we did uh, episode 54 yesterday. So 54 different home tours that we've done in the last 20 weeks or so of this, uh, this whole pandemic. And, um, you can catch me here at four o'clock most days doing these tours. Uh, most weekdays, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Fridays typically. Um, and then Tuesdays are always these talk about it Tuesday, uh, like we're doing now. And uh, so if you wanna call me 239-201-9583, you can call or text me there. Email is jerryneesman at gmail.com. Uh, again, Jerry Niesman here on Facebook or on YouTube and even on Instagram, if you want to find me there, uh, we what are there. Doing? It's Jerry Niesman there too. <laughs> make, it, make it nice and easy. Um, so yeah, check us out. Let us know if you got any questions and uh, what are we doing next week? We're doing, oh yeah, we're still talking about the money. So we're doing uh, the 10 commandments of of buying a home, the mortgage process uh, here in Southwest Florida. I don't think Debbie's seen it. Um, we have our own little 10 commandments that we hand out to every buyer when we work Thou with them. Thou shall not quit your job. <laughs> it's, it, it could be common sense, but people do it all the time. So all the um, time, all the time. Yep. So we're going to go over the 10 commandments of what, what you absolutely cannot do while trying to, to buy a home uh, anywhere in the world probably <laughs> I, I don't think it's any different even in other countries getting loans 
Uh, but definitely anywhere in the United States, if you need to get a mortgage, these are the things that you uh, either must or must absolutely not do during the process. So uh, check us out next Tuesday at four for that. And uh, otherwise, thanks for watching everybody. Debbie, thanks for joining us. Thank really you appreciate guys. you. We love you. Thank you. Thank you guys. We had such a great time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody for joining us on Facebook Live. We will see you tomorrow live at 4 p.m. Thank thanks. You. Have a great day. Oh, Rachel wants me to do her goofy little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, adorable. You have to do it until you click out. Oh, I got to do it <laughs> until I hit end. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Thank you.